In today's world where data fuels smarter businesses, approximately 32% of users experience data loss due to unreliable downtime. Thanks to Oracle's maximum availability architecture, data protection and availability for Oracle databases deployed on private, public or hybrid cloud are now a safe haven. And exactly how do we achieve that? Using Oracle's Data Guard. Let's say you have a single primary database which is your production database. To avoid unavailability of the production database due to either planned or an unplanned outage, you deploy one or more synchronized replicas of the same and call them standby databases. This type of configuration will enable you to switch the standby database to the production rule and vice versa, minimizing your downtime corresponding to the outage. These standby databases can either be a physical, logical or a snapshot standby database. Lot of options, right? But how do you implement this role reversal or switching process? This is where Data Guard comes into the picture. Data Guard can switch any standby database to the production role, minimizing the downtime associated with the outage. It thus has the ability to switch over in case of planned events or failover in case of an unplanned event, the production database to the standby database. Once the failed on-premise database is repaired, Data Guard automatically resynchronizes it with the new production database in the cloud and then switch production back to the on-premise database. To understand the data flow in a Data Guard setup better, consider the following. Oracle Net is the network configuration using which the primary database is connected to one or more standby databases. A Data Guard broker is used to control the creation and monitoring of Data Guard via GUI and command line interface. Your transactions start on the primary or production database and is stored in the program global area, the PGA. It is then copied from the PGA into the redo log buffer, where the log writer process not only collects the redo information and archive logs from the primary database, but also flushes it out to the online redo logs. The log writer network service reads this redo being flushed and sends it over network to the standby database. Its main purpose is to free up the log writer from performing the redo transport role. On the receiving end is the standby database, where Remote File Server or RFS receives the redo transmitted from the primary site and writes the network buffer or redo data to the standby redo log files or SRL. There is also an archive or ARCH process on both the primary and the standby site, performing the same function whenever a log switch occurs. That is, it generates archived log files from the online redo log ORL on the primary and standby redo logs SRL on the standby side. This archive redo log information is then applied to the standby database via managed recovery process. Moving on to the fetch archive log FAL server on the primary side and fetch archive log client on the standby side. FAL client fetches or pulls archived redo logs from the primary side. It initiates the transfer of archived redo logs when it detects a gap sequence. FAL server, on the other hand, services requests for archived redo logs from FAL clients running on multiple standby databases. Hence, multiple FAL servers can be run on a primary database, one for each FAL request. To sum it all up, your production database is used to create standby databases such that each standby can be associated with a single primary database, but a single primary database can be associated with multiple standby databases. So let's dive into a live demo where I will show you how to set up an Oracle Data Guard in Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So here we have two databases. One is primary and another is standby. Do note that both the databases have the same database name. The same is also open in PuTTY with the primary database in the black screen and the standby database in the white screen. The first step is to manually delete the database created in the OCI dbus. So once the database is ready, we'll delete the database files and restore the on-premises database using RMAN. To do that, we first get the current DB unique name and note it down somewhere. This will be used throughout the remaining steps. Now we'll create a script which will delete all database files from ASM disk groups. We'll run commands which gives data files as outputs and then use the same output to delete the files. Before deleting the data files, we have to stop the database. 
To do that, we'll use the server control command to fetch details about the database and then proceed to stop the same. Although before that, we'll first collect the configuration of the database for future references. As grid user, we'll edit files.lst created previously to remove any unneeded lines from SQL Plus. We'll leave all lines beginning with ASMCMD and save and execute the script. This will remove the existing data files, log files, and temp files. The password file will be replaced and the SP file will be reused. The second step is to copy the password file of on premise to the OCI DBAS. So, using the SCP utility, we'll send the password file from on premise databases to the OCI DBAS instance. After sending, we can see that the file is present, which came from the on premise instance. We'll change its permissions and then send it in the same location where the OCI DBAS password is stored. After this, as Oracle user, we'll verify if the password file is registered correctly or not. The third step is to copy the wallet file to the OCI DBAS host. To do this, we'll first cd into the directory where ewallet.p12 and cwallet.sso files is stored. And then, using the SCP utility, we'll copy this from the on-premise to the OCI DBAS system. After sending, we can see that the files are present which came from the on-premise instance. We'll send these files to the location where OCI DBAS stores its own version of the same. If OCI DBAS is a rack database, do the commands only on node 1. Step 4 will be to configure the static listeners. A static listener is needed for initial instantiation of a standby database. The static listener enables remote connection to an instance while the database is down in order to start a given instance. So as grid user, we'll add the following entry to listener.ora on both the cloud dbus and the on-premise host after replacing the variables. The listener.ora resides on Oracle Home Network Admin directory. For 11.2 configurations, a static listener is also required for Data Guard Broker. Add the following entry to the listener.ora on premises after replacing the variables. For rack, this must be done on both the nodes. Now, as the grid user, we'll reload the listener using the listener control utility. After we have reloaded the listener, we'll log in as Oracle user and start the standby instance. Step 5 is Oracle Net Encryption and TNS entries for redo transport. Entries for each database are needed in both primary and standby TNS names.ora files for proper redo transport. We'll use IP addresses since there is no DNS between on-premise and cloud environments to resolve server names to IP addresses. We'll enter the directory where TNS names is present and use VI editor to add the following entry for the standby instance. We'll do the same on OCI DBAS, that is, add on-premise database entry in TNS names.ora. Step 6 is to instantiate the standby database. The standby database can be created from active primary database or from a backup of the primary database. Backups can also be used to instantiate databases and may be more efficient depending on the size of the database and transfer rate between the systems. We'll now use the server control utility to first stop the database and then use rman to start the database in a no mount state. When this is done, we'll go ahead and restore the standby from the control file of the primary database. When these steps are complete, we'll go ahead and shut down the database. For rag databases, the steps will be executed in only node 1. After shutting down the database, we'll start it again from SQL Plus in a mount state. Our next step will be to clear all online and standby redo logs. To do this, we'll first create a directory in the local machine and then provide the same directory as the parameter in SQL Plus. We'll use pool to record the outputs and then use the same to delete whatever is required. All redo logs should be on the data disk group in the standby db unique name directory. Step 7 is to configure data guard broker. Now, we we'll enable dg broker config file parameter on both the primary and the standby database. Again, for this, the directory should exist in the local machine. 
So we'll use an existing directory instead of creating a new one. After enabling the parameters, we'll start the data card broker process on primary and standby databases. After the DG broker is started, we'll register the database using command line utility on the primary site. For this, we'll first create a new configuration under the primary database and add the secondary database, following which we will enable that configuration. Step 8 is to validate disaster recovery readiness. How to convert a standby database to a snapshot standby? A snapshot standby is a fully updatable standby database that is created from a physical standby database. On snapshot standby databases, redo data is received but not applied until the snapshot standby database is converted back to a physical standby database. To convert a standby database to a snapshot standby database, we'll use the command line utility. Do note that a snapshot standby database cannot be the target of a switchover or a failover. A snapshot standby database must first be converted back into a physical standby database before performing a role transition on it. Failover or switchover to the cloud. At any time, you can manually execute a data guard switchover in case of a planned event or a failover in case of unplanned event. Customers may also choose to automate data guard failover by configuring fast start failover. Switchover and failover reverses the role of databases in a data guard configuration. The standby in the cloud becomes primary and the original on-premises primary becomes a standby database. Switchovers are always a planned event that guarantees no data is lost. A failover is an unplanned event that assumes the primary database is lost. The standby database is converted to a primary database immediately after all available redo from the primary has been applied. After a failover, the old primary database must be reinstated as a physical standby, which is made simpler with flashback database and data guard broker enabled. The same role transition procedure mentioned in the failover or switchover process is applied again when you are ready to move your production back to the on premise database. CargoJet Canada's leading provider of time-sensitive overnight air cargo services carries over 1.3 million pounds of cargo each business night. To them, high availability and data protection are key requirements. They were running their 11G R2 Oracle databases on Windows operating system at their on-premise and wished to implement a disaster recovery where they could scale up the CPU on the go. Oracle, hence, implemented a heterogeneous DR2 OCI DB system with near to zero downtime migration, a task which took us lesser time than it took to perform the demo you just saw. And not just data, but terabytes of data with a total downtime of over three minutes. So congratulations, you just learned how to set up disaster recovery mechanism on Oracle Cloud infrastructure.